Ladies and gentlemen, welcome back to another episode of AWP, the Anything Wrestling Podcast. Thank you so much for joining us today. We are back on the heels of WrestleMania 38, which was this past Saturday and Sunday. I am back here today. Unfortunately, it is not a triple threat. Today is just a one-on-one match. It is myself, the Shant, and Dan, the man. Dan, I'm going to take you down, brother. Oh, sorry. The crowd, not a big fan of that guy. <laughs> At least the Raw crowd. I don't know about the WrestleMania crowd because... Uh, we didn't see him. Yeah. But uh, they, seem to, uh, they seem to have a little bit higher respect for your legends uh, on Saturday and Sunday than they did on, on Monday. Monday so. <laughs> we know that can be a ruckus crowd. But speaking of legends, I mean, it was legends galore for uh, WrestleMania, and it's a very special WrestleMania to me, not because the match card was magnificent, but there's a particular reason why, which we will get to somewhere down the line uh, when we're doing night one. But Dan, just overall, before we quickly break everything down, your overall opinion about this year's WrestleMania. My overall opinion, and first of all, like I think we were pretty on point for the most part with our predictions. Yeah, I was wa- like I was going through night one. I'm like I'm pretty sure we got that one and that one and that one and that one. I'd say we probably at least like seven out of ten. That's fair. Solid. Yeah. Um, between us, but my overall opinion of the entire weekend is first of all, like, that could you fit all of these on one night? No, but. Do I think that WrestleMania in the future should continue being a two-night thing? Not really. It's really just a money grab. I was going to say that after night two, just watching it from a TV screen, I was drained. Yeah. And to be fair, you're right. You can't fit this. But no offense to some of these performers, I feel like you can do away with six or seven matches on this card. Yeah. And and whatever you keep, like whatever remains, that can be your WrestleMania. And I think one of the problems, which I know that that's not necessarily what they want to do, and it hasn't been since like 2002, is you've got two titles on every brand, so you have to have twice as many matches. And I, I think that it waters it down because you used to get some like back... On the older ones, you'd get a quality show with your eight or nine matches on the the one night card, yeah. because you put in more care, you had higher stakes, you had more people involved, so the the anticipation was higher. Versus single match, single match, single match, single match, single match, single, 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 single and single. I don't know how many that was, but I think that was like 11 11. singles matches. And (laughs) someone brought it up to my attention. Let me just make sure before I say it. Yeah, Intercontinental and U.S. titles were not defended. Not even on the card. Yeah. So, I mean, that's kind of, you know, killed the prestige of those titles. I understand. Like, and that's another problem, too, is that you have... Raw Tag Team Championships, SmackDown Tag Team Championships, Women's Tag Team Championships. There was a moment when we were doing the preview, I'm like, how many tag team matches are there? Yeah, if you're going to, like, and I don't have a problem with having women's tag team champions, but, like, get rid of one of your men's tag teams then. Just have one per gender. Yeah, have one women's title, one women's tag, one men's uh, heavyweight, one tag, one mid-card. Just recondense, and then you can lighten up your card a little bit. Yeah. But that aside, I would probably give the overall show like a C plus B minus. I'm sort of there with you. Because yeah. there were a couple of a couple of solid matches and a couple of uh, highly enjoyable parts. Yeah. But there were also some that were just sort of like I don't need there. it. Yeah. So I mean, we can break start breaking those down, and then we'll branch over into Monday a little bit and talk about what's what comes next. What comes next. So, let's break down these matches. Let's start off with Saturday, WrestleMania Saturday. For night one, we have the uh, tag team match for the WWE SmackDown Tag Team Championships, where you have Shinsuke Nakamura and Rick Boogs walking in as the challengers, and you had the champions walking in the Usos, Jimmy and Jay, fingers pointed up, who retained the the, the championships in uh, seven minutes, 
Now, there was an incident that happened in the match, which at first I thought maybe it's a work because they're trying to get to the hot tag moment. Yeah. But apparently Rick Boogs uh, tore his, I don't know if it was meniscus uh, it was, or uh, knee or it was, ACL. It was a patellar tendon, I believe. Um, he was injured and, uh, you know, the medics came and were just kind of carrying him backstage and apparently he's injured. Yeah. But yeah, um, to be honest, the Usos have a reputation for having great opener matches. I just felt like this one, again, it's like we said, it's one of those matches that is just there. Yeah. Um, not a solid open to WrestleMania, if I'm being honest. I know, I think you and uh, Kamish said you guys thought that Rick Boogs and Shinsuke would uh, walk away as champions. I I thought that that's what was going to happen, but I also made a comment and said I wouldn't mind if the Usos walked yeah. away as champs. Which then I feel like was a sort of a prelude to Roman, you know, walking out with all the gold because now you have the bloodline with all the gold. Which may have still, that may have been the plan all along. Do I think that there's still a chance? Because I did read that the ending of the match changed. Now I didn't see how it changed or what it was supposed to be. But do I think that there's still a chance Shinsuke and Boogs went in with the in- expectation they were going to win? When? Maybe. Yeah. But. Yeah, now we've moved on to the Usos. Now we've got this dominant faction. Um, I I want to see where they go with it, with between them and, and Roman, um, to see if they actually make the most out of it. Yeah. But I I don't know. Like, it's sort of a uh, D- DX Express era type of thing going where on right now. Where has the gold and yeah. all storylines are kind of lumped into one. Yeah. So we'll we'll see how this goes, and who knows? Maybe this opens the floor a little bit for what we were just talking about, where we kind of recondense a couple of things, and we just keep it simple. Stupid. Simple, yeah. <laughs> so, uh, yeah, I am I'm fine. Yeah, retroactively with the Usos picking up the win yeah. here. Um, in the next one we got here, we got Drew McIntyre defeating. Happy Corbin with Madcap Moss, the Andre the Giant, the Battle Royal winner, mm. via pinfall in 8 minutes and 35 seconds. He's not so happy anymore. Drew McIntyre also getting the uh, re- uh, renowned distinction of being the first man to kick out of the end of days, which is... It's a great finisher. I like, love it. I like the yeah. end of days. Um, and, again, not to beat a dead horse... Match that was just kind of there. There, yeah. It was put on the card to feature Drew McIntyre because he's a little bit of a draw. We talked about that. I think that's kind of an ongoing thing because some of these matches, it's like, okay, you put this superstar in this lackluster match just so that they're there for WrestleMania season. Um, I would love to see Drew hopefully move on and get to... I. It's It sounds weird. I wouldn't mind if we go to, say, a Drew McIntyre versus Ricochet. You put him in a... Ricochet's U.S. champion? Ricochet is... Isn't a continental is... champion? I don't remember who's what. That, see, this is one of the <laughs> biggest problems. Um, Finn, I think, is U.S. Yeah, so Ricochet is uh, IC. Um, I wouldn't mind a program. If Drew versus Ricochet, you have maybe like a, a two uh, pay-per-view match or three pay-per-view matches to sort of give Drew something to do, give Ricochet something to do, because again... Ricochet as your champion. There there wasn't even any um, pre-show matches where you're like, okay, these titles were featured on the card somewhere. So Yeah, they actually had to move Sheamus and Ridge uh, in the, the New Day to night two because it was originally on day one. Oh, was it? Yeah. That explains it, considering that match was only a minute 40. But yeah, <laughs> that's my personal assessment. Yeah, I think the two major things here was the kicking out at the end of days and then Drew does this uh, post-match thing where he cuts the ropes with the sword <laughs> um so i could only imagine that if like drew had his sword in the in the thunderdome era where a lot of those cinematic matches were happening i can guarantee there would be a spot where they would like feature him maybe uh insinuating that he's decapitating someone oh probably <laughs> you know it's it's pg we dabble a little bit with game of thrones yeah, on this thing you insinuate suggest things off screen so but yeah i know there was talk of potentially shoving drew and roman together at some point but i think we have a potentially different path to follow and i know you kind of said not necessarily throwing them together immediately and we'll talk about that yes. more shortly yeah but i mean god bless drew i'm a fan me too. I just don't necessarily need him in the in the world title picture right now so i'm on board with a mid card uh mid card program at least 
Yeah, definitely. So, yeah, we'll see. I, I mean, it's safe to assume that this feud is done because this has been going on, I think, since, like, December? When he got injured, came back at the yeah. Rumble, threw them out, and then the whole fiasco. But, yeah, hopefully Drew can now move on and do something different. Um, with that said, we go to our third match of the night. Uh, we have a tag team match. You have The Miz and Logan Paul getting one over on Ray and Dominic Mysterio the Mysterios in a match that was 11 minutes and 15 seconds. Uh, one of the few matches to feature um, outside uh, people, so to speak, celebrities. Mm-hmm. Um yeah, you basically have one on each night. Yeah, I this uh, I hate to say it. I thought that like I, it was at this point where I'm like, okay, very very weak beginning to a WrestleMania yeah. because this was once again a match that I p- particularly wasn't a fan of, and I feel like I made this comment while the match was going on. I feel like Miz has become your oh, we need a celebrity to tag team with someone. Let's get the Miz in there. Yeah. So, Mr. Hollywood. <laughs> yeah. So, I mean, again, this match was there. Yeah, I think they tried to give you a surprise with Miz betraying Logan Paul at the end of the match with the skull crushing finale. But even then, I was like, eh. well, and I read something that talked about how Logan Paul may have a face turn written into his contract. So that might have opened the door for that, where here in the nearish future, he's going to come back and he's going to interact with The Miz, and that's going to be a program. I think the problem is that the audience takes it as The Miz is the face in this situation, and he's the heel, because everybody cheered that. Probably. Um, I also saw a meme that uh, was Miz putting the skull-crushing finale on him in Logan Paul's face. Just looked like he was having a great time, and it said, I'm just here. I'm just happy to be here taking a skull-crushing finale. I saw that. So, I don't know. It was an okay match. It was there. Like, the the three heavy hitters in there of Ray, Dominic, and Miz, they can carry a match. Yeah. I'm, I'm never worried about them putting on a bad match, but... It wasn't one you were particularly invested in. Exactly. But that brings us to the next match. Here we go. Where I think this was the first one we really got, like, those flashier entrances. I love the Marvel-esque, Marvel Studios-esque video package they put together for Becky. Wasn't too crazy about the marching band for Bianca. Yeah. But I get it. You're trying to beef it up, and this is, like, your midpoint. But for me... Like I th- I, and I weigh this a little bit higher than the match after it, but I think this was my match of the night from a yeah. from a quality standpoint, because Becky and Bianca went out there and they fought and they beat the hell out of each other, and you built the drama and then you had Bianca go over with that with the uh, KOD KOD God. and uh, yeah nineteen minutes like you can tell from that. And the next one, where they were kind of putting their energy. Their energy into, yeah. So, no, I, I loved this match. I'd easily give this one an A-, minus, if not an A. But, yeah, it was it was up there for me. Yeah, I, this was the first match that I was like, okay, finally a match where I actually want to see what happens. Um, from a match standpoint, honestly, maybe I have to go back and rewatch it, but I just felt like it, it was... Like, it was just there, you know? Like, I honestly feel like Sasha and Bianca from last year, like, that's that's a match where it's like, wow, that that's a crazy match full of ups and downs. This one, I feel like, was a little bit more straightforward, pulling out all the moves one by one. There was a moment where I think Becky also did a super kick, which was, like, yeah. a breath of fresh air, kind of introducing new things to her rep- repertoire. But... Bianca rightfully winning and I think I expressed this comment to you guys that it was about time because I feel like Becky being champion for 500 some odd days whatever the the deal was um I felt like okay we've we've ridden we're like we were on that wave okay she comes back and she does the whole deal where she squashes Bianca in 26 seconds which thankfully they kind of found a way to bounce her back off of that they didn't just like kill off her career and the fact that they kind of mirrored that even at the beginning at of the, the beginning, match and then kind yeah. of said, all right, let's get this out of the way and yeah. show that ah, Bianca's, she's gotten over it. Yeah, so, no, yeah, it was fine. Uh, definitely the right person won. Um, Becky didn't make an appearance on Raw, so I don't know if we're going with the deal where, oh, she's going to kind of be in the shadows until further notice. 
Um, Bianca had that nasty black eye, yeah. so... Uh, you Couldn't know. even put her eyelash on. <laughs> no. Um, I don't think we even think she could blink, because, like, every time she would blink, like, the eye that was good would blink, and the other one would just kind of, like... Twitch. Twitch a little bit. <laughs> um, but, no, yeah, like, it was fine. Um, yeah, hell, hell of a match. Um, I know I, I sort of speculated um, in a conversation after the fact that... Not only could I see this leading to a Becky Lynch face turn to kind of get her off the big time Bex thing for Double a while, turn. but Bianca, I got sort of borderline heelish vibes from her promo, which I mean was yeah, it was I'm the best, I'm the EST, I got this belt, I'm not gonna let it go, but it had this sort of like I'm like um, very Lord of the Rings quality to it. Of like, okay, now she's got the ring of power and it's it's corrupting her a little <laughs> bit. Cause it felt like this is my precious. Yeah. And so I'm I'm curious to see over the next couple of weeks how that goes, because that could even be Bianca starts to go more and more heelish over the next couple of weeks. She beats the hell out of a couple of faces, and then in somebody's moment of need, face Becky Lynch comes back and it You do the it, double turn. You do the double turn. And it freshens it up a little bit, but gives us that rematch because these two are great and I don't want to burn them out and I don't want to get tired of them, but I could watch another match between the two if be- with, with face, face Becky, Becky and then heel, and heel Bianca. Bianca. Um, we'll get to this later down the line because we're obviously we're not there yet, but I told you guys how WrestleMania Raw was very lackluster. Yeah. I felt like one thing you could have done is that if Bianca was in a match, whether she, like, on Raw, if she was in a match, win, lose, or draw, if she turned heel on Raw, yeah. that would have been, like, your big, oh, shit. Yeah. Um. So, you know, but we didn't really get anything, and I can sort of see what you're saying, that this could lead to a heel turn, which is fine, because Bianca has been a face for more than a minute, so... Yeah. It seems like like a like a good time. I don't want to say just the right time, but you know, a good time to change that change that gimmick. And the whole EST thing can work either way because it can either it can. be it can yeah. either be inspirational as or a in face, your face or I'm better than you and you know. It. And I think it's an easy enough transition. And she, I, I have every faith that they could pull this off Definitely. to go the other way too. Yeah, wrestling, ladies and gentlemen. <laughs> Um, the next match, uh, so much to talk about here, so much like subtext and so many things to uncover. We have our fifth match of the evening. So before the match officially began, it was Seth Rollins versus a... Sorry, sorry what, what's his name? It's Seth freaking Rollins, uh, a.k.a. Yeah. Sako Rollins, Jan, my guy. Um, Sorry, I didn't know who you were talking about until just now. Of course you didn't. Um, but before a match t- had taken place, it was Seth Rollins is going to be at WrestleMania with a mystery opponent that is going to be chosen by Mr. McMahon. I think that's how they like yeah. advertised it. Which I was expecting events to come out and actually announce it, but mm-hmm. eh. Which thank just God from the didn't. way they phrased it. But. Yeah, which thank God they didn't because honestly, just like with commercials in between each match and just like the long ramp that all these guys have to walk down, it's a long enough show as it is. Yeah. So it just kind of cut to the chase type of deal. But uh, Seth comes to the ring after a few minutes of making everybody wait. Pyro goes off, the lights go out, and I'm shocked because you hear it in its purest form. It wasn't WWE-fied. It wasn't smoke and mirrors. It wasn't, you know, dashing Cody Rhodes. It was the American Nightmare Cody Rhodes with that theme music, which, by the way, if you go and take a look at the lyrics of that song, like, it's it's pretty much obvious who that's directed towards. Yeah. So, after a six-year hiatus of not being in WWE, going off and starting off AEW... Cody Rhodes returns in a shocking, one of the most shocking moments, not only of the night, not only of this WrestleMania, but any WrestleMania. Yeah. Um, Cody Rhodes comes back and defeats Seth Rollins in 21 minutes and 40 seconds, your longest match of the night, actually. Yeah, they gave these boys time to go. Yeah. And uh, actually, Co- uh, we want you to talk about Bianca getting a bruised eye. Cody actually cut like his forehead, you know, was kind of like swelled up because I saw Seth Rollins like threw a few kicks and actually Cody like kind of covered it up after the fourth kick because I think he felt that something was up. But 
I will just say this. We always talk about how we feel like WWE won't do business. And they, they, it's just – it's them and everybody else is, is enemy. You want to talk about – and like that's the thing too is when the theme song hit and everything. I was like, hold on. Let's see if he's actually there because in my mind, I'm like they could easily make this like a joke where they hit the song and they, you know, they dim everything out like, oh, he's here and then they, they get you. Um, but no, when he came out, I was like, okay. And there was speculation that, oh, he could come back, but he might lose the match and it'll just kind of be a one-off thing. Yeah. But no, he came back, you know, full entrance, full color scheme, full name, full gear, full, full everything. Half full, full gear. Cody. Get it? Full <laughs> Cody. Um, first and last name, by the way. Yeah. And, uh, this honestly, like it was a, it was, it was a great match. Um, I'm still like it's one of those things where this along with the very last match of night one I'm still trying to process it's like did this really happen um but what do you think because Cody I felt like was always one of those guys where you're like look a lot of people will come back into the business even if they say they will never come back but Cody to me was like this guy started a rival company. Yeah. And in, I feel like in Vince's mind, you're taking money away from me. You're taking, you know, equity away from me. So you're not allowed here. But who would have thought that Cody, out of all people, and a lot of people have insinuated you have all these guys going from WWE to AEW. But that one time when the shoe's on the other foot, it's like... It's Cody. It's the guy himself. Yeah. So, like, I'm, st- I'm still trying to digest all this, but I, I don't know. What did you think? Um, this, w- this one was my second match of the night. Um, the only thing I didn't like about it was the way they actually ended it. Interesting. Because um, I, I, it just – I know he, he did two crossroads, then he did the, um, bionic, the bionic elbow. elbow, and then he did one more crossroads. Crossroad, yeah. And it just felt like that droned on a little bit. Was it, like – I'm making a statement. I'm putting this guy down. Yes. But to that degree, Becky Lynch lost with from one KOD there at the end of the match. And then you have Seth go through three of Cody's finishers, show up the next night, shake his hand, laugh. And it's weird. Um, it's a weird segment. But, no, I, I enjoyed the match thoroughly. I look forward to what they're – gonna do with cody i imagine he probably has a decent amount of control written into his contract do we want to talk about what we think his where his future plans are do we want to save that for wrestlemania raw i would say i'll i would say let's save it until we've addressed the champion um but yeah all in all solid match two great performers i think cody did show a couple of small signs of ring rust because he he hasn't I think he's been out of wrestling, like, not wrestling, but he's been out of being an active performer for a little while, even over in AEW. So well, I'd like to think he did some training beforehand, but, like, there were a couple of things, and it might also just be an incompatibility thing where he and Seth didn't get enough time, because it seemed like there were a couple of small miscues. Like, at one point, Seth went for the stomp, and Cody was facing the yeah, wrong way. Yeah, it was a little wonky, yeah, yeah, yeah. And so there were a couple of things that they needed they to line avoid. up. Yeah, yeah. yeah. But all in all, uh, the story was there, the energy was there, and I found this to be a very enjoyable match. Absolutely. And now, moving on to the next match. Oh, hold on, hold on. My phone's vibrating. Let's see what the... Oh, I have a text message from the commish. Oh, he actually... He wanted to send his thoughts on this match specifically. That's weird. Interesting. Let's see. So, according to the commish... He's saying that he thinks that Charlotte Flair and Ronda Rousey had hands down the match of the night. He says that Charlotte and Ronda have both earned his undying respect and that if anyone wants to challenge him on this being just a top tier match, he will fight them. That doesn't sound right. That doesn't sound If you guys know anything about the commission, I Do you think he's been kidnapped? This doesn't seem right. This, oh, oh, never mind. He just sent me another message. He's just kidding. So let's talk about this match. Charlotte Flair defeats Ronda Rousey via pinfall for the Smack to retain the SmackDown Women's Championship in your third, third longest match of the night, which just goes again to show you that Becky and Bianca have more stock than these two 
Cody coming back had more stock than these two. And then the match ends on a big boot. So let's talk about this for just one second because I know we usually like to come on here. Look, here's the thing. We weren't really a fan of this match to begin with. And I actually thought it was weird that you have both women's matches in night one. Yeah. As opposed to having one championship match night one, one championship match night two to kind of give it an even split. But if you want me to play devil's advocate for just one second, okay, let me try to buy into your story that you're pitching to me. So you tell me year around that Ronda Rousey is the baddest woman on the planet. That she has broken all these glass ceilings and she's and a mm-hmm. <laughs> Um And ankles as of recent. But you mean to tell me that you're hyping her up to be this baddest woman on the planet... And then she loses to a generic big boot. Yeah. Uh Uh-huh. Dan? Why? Why do you expect me to buy this finish? Because I don't. In fact, I have the receipt. I would like to return it. It's past the return point. Son of a bitch. So anyway, Charlotte, who has been just grating, grating, like cheese, yes. grating for a long time. <clears throat> and Rhonda, who we know up, has wow. issues. I've, I've never seen you this frustrated. Well, no, I'm just saying. like this, this is kind of, in a way, like Goldberg and Lesnar. Which, oh, the first one? Yeah, when Austin was the special ref. Yeah. Like, it, it, I mean, Charlotte's still there to get the paycheck and be the face of the company. And the belt. But it, it just sort of had this, like, energy about it where, like, I don't really care, you don't really care, why does anybody care type of thing for me anyway. Yeah. And you've got, and especially because Rhonda's always throwing these temper tantrums. She comes back acting like a heel. They say, Rhonda, you're the face. Fucking act like it. <laughs> So she goes out there and she tries to be all butterflies and sunshine. And, like, she starts to win a couple of people over in general where we're like, okay, maybe she's not the worst ever. And then we get to um, the Hall of Fame, apparently. And she throws a hissy fit because Stone Cold Steve Austin gets the main event. Of course Stone Cold Steve (laughs) Austin gets the main event. Are you kidding me? The fact that you got the second main event... Should make you happy in that case. What? I bet you she wouldn't have bitched if The Rock was the one getting the main event because they're homies. But, like, come on. Relax. Have some humility. Understand that you're not always going to be the main event. Well, I know that Becky also made a comment about that, about she doesn't know why she was before those two. Yeah. Um, and even she was asked, would you want you and Rousey to be the uh, the the match because that's essentially what we wanted during her first run but she said no because i feel like she still has ring rust ring rust um and she's not ready and i would like her to be a little bit more polished before we have a main event together which is a fair point and she even went on to trash her and say we're gonna have the better match and the appeal is our match which it was um yeah on that note i think charlotte just doesn't have chemistry with anybody well, because I also made the point, if for half a second, if we say that Rousey won the belt, I my running slogan is that I give anywhere from two weeks to two months until Charlotte gets that belt back. Yeah. So at this point, it's like, why should I care? If yeah, you win, lose, draw, if I know that that belt is eventually coming back around your waist. And then you have Ric Flair, who, God bless Ric Flair, I love the guy, but, um, you know, oh... What what did he say? Match of the night, of greatest the night. Na- greatest match ever between two. Yeah, Rick, calm down. Seriously, uh, we get it. It's your daughter, and you want to be proud. But let's call a spade a spade here. Shayna, <sighs> um, she had a better match. But yeah, this was a disappointing women's title match. I wasn't sold on it. I thought the conclusion of the match was very weak, rubbish, very weak. So I. <laughs> But I made the point, I said, if in the booking world, if you want to salvage it, if Charlotte had removed the turnbuckle yeah. and smashed Ronda's head into the turnbuckle and then done a big boot, I would have been like, okay, I, I'll, I'll, I'll buy it. But the fact that it was just ref bump, big boot, one, two, three, and like Rousey gets up almost immediately and it's like, you're not even selling. Yeah. 
Um, I don't know if this was um, another send Ronda on her way thing. Like maybe Ronda threw such a little hissy fit when she wasn't. Was that event. just speculation? Or... I I don't know. I heard I I heard multiple accounts suggesting it. So I I feel like there may be some grain of truth to it. But if if she's all bent out of shape, maybe she was like, you know what? I don't want it anymore. I'm I changed my mind. And maybe she's gonna just hit ride off on her into the sunset again. Maybe she'll go have another baby, just like Charlotte was telling her to. And then come back at WrestleMania 40. Maybe. But, yeah. Let's move on. This one's not worth talking about anymore. Let's so. move on to this match. It is the main event of night one. I will sound like a broken record when I say this, but I'm going to say it until my dying breath. My 18-year dream came true. I'm saying 18, not 19, because I became a wrestling fan in 2004. My 18-year dream of seeing my hero, my childhood and young adulthood hero, wrestling in what presumably, I'm guessing, is going to be his last match. I don't see Austin really ever wrestling. Then again, never say never if night one is any consolation. But you have, which at first we thought this was just going to be a segment. He's going to be on the KO show, maybe give a stunner and then ride off. But we got an actual match. Stone Cold Steve Austin defeating Kevin Owens in the main event in a no-holds-barred match. It says it was 13 minutes, 55 seconds. Let's just say it was 14 minutes to round it <laughs> off. Um, I will get started, I guess. Um, I was shocked. Literally, like from the moment where KO was like, I brought you here not to talk to you, but to challenge you to a match. So at this point, I'm thinking, okay, they're doing it. And then when Austin is like, you want me to open up a can of whoop ass on this guy? Give me a hell yeah, get a referee out here. At this point, I'm thinking, bell rings, KO goes for a clothesline, Austin ducks, Stone Cold Stunner, pinfall, 15 second match. Yeah. But the fact that they actually gave us a match, and yes, like, there are certain instances where, for example, they set up a table and Kevin goes through the table, Austin doesn't go through the table. Yeah. So. But in to be fair, Austin took a suplex on the outside on the concrete and then had to work through giving KO two suplexes on the outside by the ramp, which I don't care who you are, that still hurts you because yeah. that's your back going into the ramp. Um, we get a full match. Austin does the stunner. One, two, three. Austin picks up the victory. My dream, my 18-year dream is fulfilled. Um, I literally, at the very end, I was watching it with two of my friends, Kamish being one of them, and I said, and if anybody ever says that dreams don't come true, I want you guys to remember this moment because it's going to sound cheesy and corny and whatever, but my 18-year dream finally came true. And as an active wrestling fan, I got to see my hero compete in a match. Like that, and it, if it was a squash match, I'd be like, "Yeah, they gave it to us, but, but. They, you know, but there is no but here. Yeah. I I can't say a but here." Um, what did you think? Your assessment from how we thought this was just gonna be a segment to what it turned out being. Now, did like what I'll say is, uh, God bless him. Age has caught up with Austin a little bit. Yeah. Um, he was not in ring shape for years, so the fact that he got to the point where he could take these bumps is miraculous. Um, the the one spot that I think everybody was kind of not an, like anticipating, but like you know the one where you're like it's gonna it's gotta happen. Yeah, was KO hitting Austin Washington. with the stunner, <laughs> yeah. and you go oh, oh, oh he kicked out ah. So then, at that point, it becomes a who has the superior stunner yeah. undertone. And they did it. They did it. Yeah. Um, it was definitely enjoyable. And if you want to even, like, use this as another jumping off point, on the next night, does he main event the other show, too? No. So, Austin understands how the business works. Austin understands that you're not always going to be the main draw on a night. But he showed up, he did his dues on this one, and yeah, it was fun, and everybody got a, got a nice, um, what we assumed was our little crowning moment. And it was, okay, cool, that's a nice 
end to the to the rattlesnake for from a career standpoint. Yeah, and then we get the true bookend of the the on night two, but to have him do an actual match. Great to see you, Steve. Yeah, and especially because I think for you, this is something that everybody, anytime WrestleMania would come around, especially to Texas, like if you remember 10 years back, CM Punk yeah. was the conversation. Austin versus Punk because you have the, the straight edge guy versus the beer drinker and, you know. And yeah, the that. anti-authority versus the anti-authority. Yeah. There were parallels to be drawn. Which I think at the time, like, that still would have been a great match. I would have loved to see it personally. But this also has, a like, a nice story to it, too, because... For those of you who don't know, there is photos out there of a young KO taking a picture with the Steve Austin. There are, you know, there is a KO doing a podcast when he was an independent wrestler on Steve Austin's podcast. So there is that nice little parallel. Now, they did an MJF and CM Punk it where in every promo they told you, here's a picture of me with the Steve Austin at a young age. It's like they just, they knew, they know everybody knows all this. Yeah. And they just sort of, you know... They gave you that story of, and that's the thing too, ma- major round of applause to Seth and KO because both of them were in a similar position of one person from each feud has to go out and tell a story until WrestleMania when their opponent shows up. Yeah. So the fact that the both of these guys were able to do that, like I was hooked on yeah. both of those stories. I'm like, Seth, we know he's going to Mania obviously, but like from a storyline perspective, where are we going with this? Yeah. And then for KO, it's like, oh, he teased the crowd, he made fun of Austin, he dressed up like him, you know, he got the audience all wound up, and all for this moment. So, WrestleMania night one, capping off with that main event, I mean, again, I was ecstatic. I was still trying to process it because the Cody match and the Austin match were the two things where I'm like, did that just happen? Yeah. It's something that it's still trying to like I'm still trying to process in my mind. Did this actually happen? So yeah, no, I got to see my childhood hero compete in his presumably his last match. Uh, I saw a little tease that apparently Vince might be in Austin's ear about a Saudi Arabia thing, which I don't know. I, I, I hope I, not. I, I just hope not let it because, just let him be. Yeah, I think this was a fine way to yeah, to cap it off. Let it go if it's if if it ain't broke, don't fix it. Exactly. So we so, can now move on to WrestleMania Sunday. Yeah. And we'll we'll talk about which night we think we ended up being the superior night once we get to the end. But yeah. we go into night two. We started off uh, pretty strong yes. with the triple threat tag match for the Raw Tag Team Championship. I predicted a heel turn from Randy with the Street Profits going over. Did not happen. Doesn't mean it won't at some point. Again, I read an article or an interview with Randy where he said, I'm, I'm having a great time. Yeah. I'm having a great time with Riddle. I didn't like him originally, but he's yeah. warmed on me, and we're doing, we're doing good stuff. I'm enjoying what I do. Kind of like Brock. Yeah. And so, by all means, go ahead. Take Randy and Riddle as far as it can go. Um, I'm fine with it. But so RK Bro ends up retaining, um, and uh, I believe this is where Gable Steveson... Uh, also gets involved with Chad Gable because we're going to basically do amateur wrestler versus amateur wrestler Olympian stuff. versus uh, yeah. Olympian. Um, honestly, I thought that this match, which was, by the way, 11 minutes and 30 seconds, I thought this was a very great opener, high spots, you know, fast action. I feel like this is what the Uso match should have been from night one, where yeah. you have this tremendous opener to kind of get the crowd going. So from that perspective, it was such a great match. A lot of very memorable spots in this match. Riddle hitting that springboard RKO and then Randy getting one of his own was a pretty cool spot. Riddle's was a cool spot. I was a little concerned about Montez afterwards because he went down sort of like at a at an angle. And I was yeah. like, eh, I hope he's okay. Yeah. But so, yeah, no. Th- th- those those are the moments you, you look for on these big shows. These big something shows. that stands out. Yeah. And they, they crushed it on this one. So uh, RK, RK Bro goes over, and I, I was the one who told you and Kamish, I was like, I still believe that there's fuel left in the tank for RK Bro. I still think that there is stuff that can be done with these two. So um, they won, and yes, you said um, that after the match, uh, what's his name? The Olympian. Uh, Gable Stevenson. Gable Stevenson. Um, and I think that's their way of kind of introducing him to the WWE universe. Uh, I'm assuming he's going to make a debut sometime very, very soon. So they're trying to, you know, kind of get everybody's appetite going for that. But um, before we move on, one thing that we missed out on is that Triple H 
officially retired in the middle of the ring yes. with a very short segment. He left his boots in the ring, threw up the two sweets sign and said, I just came out here to say thank you and just sort of walked off and left the ring to the performers. So ironically, on two nights where The Undertaker kind of brings an end to his career, Austin brings an end to his career. Triple H brings an end to his career. It's sort of like, okay, it's We've officially... We've finally reached the end of the Attitude Era. <laughs> end of an era. <laughs> Once in a lifetime. Um, but no, yeah, this match was great. Um, great opener. Um, <laughs> and on that note, if The Rock ever does come back for his match with Roman, I feel like that'll be his last match. I don't think he's doing anything after that one. That's, that's, a, that's a very good bookend ending for The Rock, and it's been teased for so long at this point that I think it's inevitable that it happens. But um, we move on to the second match of the night. You have Bobby Lashley defeating Omos in a singles match in 6 minutes and 35 seconds. Which, this is the opposite of what I anticipated. I was expecting Omos to go over and Bob, it was going to be like, oh, okay, new big guy on campus. Which they're kind of still doing. They did the next night. Now they just took the undefeated streak pressure off of Omos. Um... And we had a face turn from Bobby Lashley. Yeah. So, I don't know. The match, I, I'm not a big fan of Omos. I, I, like, maybe he'll get better in time, but a lot of the time, these big dudes are big. Yeah. And that's it. That's really all they got going. <laughs> um, big Show, probably the most agile uh, and, and functional I guess, big man that we've had probably ever. I can't think of anybody else who's been the same level of, and I'm not talking, well, I mean, I guess you could you could reference like Kane and The Undertaker, but I'm talking like these like monsters. Well, someone who I think just wasn't given a fair chance, kind of was early on in his career, but then that kind of dwindled. Uh, and I'm not saying by any means he's on Big Show's level, but I feel like potentially one day he could have been, uh, was Braun Strowman. Yeah, okay. So, and I don't, again, I don't know if this story is true. And I think you're the one that introduced to me where basically, apparently the reason why Strowman was let go was because Vince was like, my new big guy is here, so I don't need yeah. you anymore. <laughs> um, I, I don't, again, I don't know if that's true. If it is, shame on him because you can't take a five, six year vet and be like, the new guy in town is here, so you can be off on your way. Yeah. Um, yeah, no, the match wasn't particularly interesting. There was a scary bump. It wasn't a bump, but uh, where uh, at first I thought Corey was just exaggerating, but Bobby Lashley kind of goes back and hits his head on the steel turnbuckle um, post, and which was very, very scary. But then they conclude the match with the reverse spear and yeah. then with the regular spear. Um Omos, I'm not too sold on him. I think yeah. his most dominant and peak performance was last year's Mania when they brought him in to win the title with AJ. And then after that, it's like, you're just there. Basically. Speaking of scary spots, I do just want to jump back to night one for one second and get your, your thoughts on it. During the Bianca-Becky match, they were on the turnbuckle, and Bianca had Becky up on her shoulders and ch just kind of chucked her back and jumped down, and yeah. Becky went over the corner of the ropes. Uh-huh. Oh, that did not that one did not feel good for me. I don't how did, how did you feel in that moment? That one cuz I at first I thought she was going to gorilla press her and yeah. then like like fall forward and then like have Becky Becky I, land behind yeah, her. Yeah, I was almost expecting like a Green Bay plunge. Yeah, but then when she like she jumped off but then she just kind of let Becky go. I was like, Ugh. um but what was impressive yet scary at the same time, which I didn't catch because I thought it was from the top rope, but it was from the middle rope, was the 450 splash. Yeah. Because Bianca presumably almost lands on her feet, yeah. and, but then like her feet just kind of like go behind just her and roll, then she, yeah. she lands on Becky. Yeah, second rope, you don't have a ton of, a ton of air. Which I was more so. impressed with because for a second, I, I, I was like sporadically looking away and I'm like, oh, third rope, okay. And then when they show the replay, I'm like, oh, it was from the second rope. Yeah. So it's it's a little bit more scarier, yet a little bit more impressive. Yeah. But yeah, that's how you get the black eyes and stuff of that yeah. nature, <laughs> with those stiff matches. So. But yeah, so Bobby and Om Omas, we went to the next night. Omas now aligned with MVP instead. Bobby now a face. Presumably we keep this going. Probably only for like one more match. Hopefully. I can't imagine this is going to be a long feud. 
but MVP and Omas will probably, I imagine, probably build to some mid card feud to give Omas his first title. Yeah. Um, I don't really care though. I don't either. Yeah. Um, but then we jump into this next one, which I know you're a big fan of, <laughs> where our second celebrity guest, Johnny Jonathan Knoxville, defeated Sami Zayn in an Anything Goes match, which featured a ton. A ton of jackass props and cast members. Sami Zayn forever. So Knoxville goes over, which I think we all predicted this one because it was basically your face. So I, I was hoping Sami would win. So I. Oh, that's decide. right. Yeah. Commissioner, I said Johnny Knoxville because yeah. we were anticipating your face guest yeah. be going over, which they, he did. But uh, go ahead, open up your your notes on the match, because I know you, you had fun with this one. Yeah, well, honestly, before this match, uh, and you can go back and listen to the preview, I wasn't a fan, because I thought this was going to be another one of your celebrity comes and does a thing or two, and then we go home. But almost like five minutes in, yeah. you can see the direction this thing is going. They have mouse traps, they have the big hand... They have all uh, Jackass cast members, you know, like come out from under the ring. Um, and this goes on for 14 minutes. It didn't, and it didn't feel like it because yeah. it was entertaining. Um, but I'm saying they got, to, they got time. This was the second longest thing in the night. Which is fair. And that <laughs> surpasses the main event, by the way. Yeah. Um, this was impressive. I think both of them should be very proud of what they did. And I think I talked about it from a social media standpoint. It was fun because I think that's how this story was being told was less on TV, more on social media, like with Knoxville displaying Sammy's number and Sammy, can I just eat my food? Yeah. <laughs> um, no, it was fun. And Sammy Zayn is another one of those guys where I've had a lot of stock in him because I truly believe he will take any situation and just try to make it work. Yeah. So this being another one of those situations, it seems like they really put their heads together and like, okay, how do we make this different from everything else that's going on in the card? And they did. And this was actually from an entertaining standpoint. This one hit home. So th this was great. This was awesome. I enjoyed it. Now, do I need Johnny Knoxville in another match? Probably not. But <laughs> I also think it was from like a um, advertising standpoint. Yeah, from Jackass, Jackass Forever. forever. So there's that. Yeah. Um, but now, now, whenever we get back to the, the weekly Raw guest host, sure, he can stop by again. Please don't. <laughs> we'll get Al Sharpton instead. Or maybe Will Smith. Ooh. Um, okay, get it? Because there was a hand stopping in the match. Never mind. Um, moving on to the next match here. Another one. Again, I am very happy at the outcome of this. Our fourth match of the night, you have Naomi and Sasha Banks defeating Carmel and Queen Zelina, who walked in as champions, versus Easy, easy Dan, Liv Morgan and Rip 'em Rap 'em, Rhea Ripley, and versus Who's Natalia? <laughs> and Shayna Baszler, uh, by pinfall in a fatal four way tag team match for the WWE Women's Tag Team Championships, ten minutes and fifty seconds. <laughs> It almost plays like Natalia and Shayna are siblings on the screen. Natalia and Shayna Baszler. Like, they're both the the Baszler sisters. Get it? Like, the queen of hearts and the queen of spades. Yeah. They, like, I don't know why they haven't steered more into that. Damn. Um, why? Anyway. Um, so we, we, I think, collectively said Naomi and Sasha. For but I think you one. and I, we had different intentions as to why we wanted Naomi and Sasha to win. is because... They also kind of like really threw this out there in every post-match interview. Oh, Sasha, you've been a part of so many great matches at Mania. And yet you're winless. <laughs> yeah. You are the reverse Undertaker. You are 0 and 6. Now we change that to 1 and 6. She finally gets her win. Um, and actually, I didn't even realize this. Do you realize that your Raw Women's Champion and your WWE Women's Tag Team Champions all are black women? Oh. Like, it's such a neat thing to think about, you know? Like, yeah. you kind of, like, for, forget about it. And but... then Charlotte. Uh, <laughs> but no, that, uh, it, it's always nice, even when you don't necessarily think about it, yeah. to realize that the company that for so long seemed to kind of dig their heels in and just sort of stick to their own Stereotypical ways. Stereotypical stuff. 
is is still making some degree of progress because yeah. if you look at the last two years, you've had <laughs> you've had a bunch of African American champions. Yeah, between Kofi and Biggie and uh, Bobby and uh, I mean Sasha, and then Bianca and then Sasha and Naomi. There's a lot. Yeah, and in the previous years, like. It was like where it was a where's Waldo of, yeah. of championship, and so no, it's not, it's it's real nice to to see that sort of thing play out. Um, did I selfishly kind of want Liv to to win? Yes. Did I, I think it. she was going to win? No. Um, and it's building toward a breakup with those two, which yeah. seems awkward because we just had we a just... breakup with um, the other the other one. Um, Wait, Nikki Nikki Ash. You couldn't say your body I, name. I forgot what her, her ring name is. Um, and it sounds like Rhea may or may not turn. or potentially turn. And she might even align herself with um, the new brood or whatever the hell they're going to call that's themselves. That's actually very interesting. That would be interesting. Um, and I think that's... I think I kind of mentioned this with the bloodline is that that's something we're missing is a faction that is co-ed. Yeah. Um, uh, at this point. But yeah, so Carmella and Queen Zelina, I think are are I think they basically ran their course. Um, Natty doesn't have anything to do, and neither does Shayna, except to train Ronda Rousey to lose her match. Um, <laughs> and I want Liv to get a title match, but I want her to win a title. I would even be okay with her beating Charlotte and then dropping the title back to Charlotte. <laughs> well, it's funny as long that- as she gets one. Um, it, I know that earlier we talked about Bianca turning heel. Yeah. That could be a target for Bianca. Like, yeah. take advantage of, quote-unquote, the weak. Yeah. Because how many titles have you won? Um, and you can build that. Yeah. You know, where it's I basically... just don't want Liv to keep losing is the problem. Yeah. I mean, it's not... I, I think the audience loves her enough to where she's kind of... Not untouchable. But she's... A, she's um, I'm trying to think of, like, an analogous wrestler of somebody who could just probably Elias like you you liked Elias there was something about his character that you were just like ah oh, this guy and you still liked him even when he was being a dick yeah. even when he was losing yeah I think it's kind of the same thing with Liv people just they like her because she's fun and she's quirky and she's charismatic yeah and so even if she's losing you still want to and she's got that underdog factor that you still want to root for and so, I don't know, at some point, I just, I don't want to just keep seeing her lose. I want her to see, get that climb to the top. And if I have to wait till next WrestleMania and she gets a WrestleMania moment to win a title, but... If, if I can just interject with yeah. this for one second. See, this is why one of the big reasons why when I say when certain pay-per-views like Royal Rumble and Money in the Bank come around, you have to be very careful of who you're selecting. Yeah. Because, I mean, look, here's the thing. We could have still gotten Charlotte versus Rousey without her winning the Rumble. Yeah. You don't need an excuse for Rousey to be like, oh, you but need now to it's, qualify. But now it's wasted. It's wasted. Yeah. As opposed to maybe if we gave that to Liv, dare I say, you know, you could have gone either way. You could have either rekindled Becky and Liv. Like, you got me a few times, but I'm back to challenge you for that championship. Yeah. Or you could have gone back to Charlotte. Hey, you held people like you have held me down, so I'm here to take your belt. Yeah. So we we crutch occasionally too heavily on these like big names versus developing a new name. And that's been the biggest problem is that really like, like it's a it's a running joke, but other than Roman, who are your top stars that can challenge him right now? Drew. <laughs> and Cody. And Seth. And that's about it. If you can't have an Armageddon Hell in a Cell, you don't have enough stars. Or a championship scramble. Or a championship (laughs) goddamn scramble. Um, But, yeah, Naomi and Sasha go over. Um, Congratulations to them. I I just hope we don't... I I would like them to get a nice nice little run. I don't want to see Sasha just turn on Naomi in a month and a half. Well, another big problem is name me some of the biggest tag teams. You don't have any. That's the problem. I know. That's that's always been the problem. You have to develop things. You have to plan them out. You have to draft them out, and they don't always do that. And this is a time where that's very highlighted because Car- Carmella and Queen Zelina, you can, I mean, their their gimmicks don't match. 
So it's a weird tag team, but you can see those two together. Um, but Liv and Rhea are a patchwork team, and Natty and Shayna are a patchwork team. They just, they don't mesh. And that's the problem. Naomi, Sasha, I can I can get behind. Yeah. They have enough of a similarishness to their um, personas where you can see them together. Kind of out there with the lights and the sparkle and also yeah. being held down. They're very know. colorful yes. personalities. And so that, that fits together like two nice puzzle pieces. But then you get Natty, who's this like weird blonde technical wrestler, and, and Shayna, who is this I'm going to beat the hell out of you and break your arm type of MMA fighter. And you're like, I don't buy it. Yeah. So I don't know. They, that's something they probably need to work on over the next couple of months is look at the entire roster, even if you want like Raquel and Dakota. I don't know how, where, how they match up, but looking at that graphic, I can buy it. Yeah. Um, so even if they have to look at NXT and bring somebody up and not waste them, well, then that I, would work. I, like, I know I think it was it Sasha that threw it out there where she's like, I would love, and this would be great, but then or at toxic that point. toxic even, but go ahead. Yeah, toxic attraction. Yeah, for sure. But I think if, if you were to go with this idea, you would have to pin it down to one women's tag team belt. Um, if you have, say, Sasha and Naomi, go from brand to brand. Yeah. Maybe one second we're in NXT. Maybe then we're in NXT UK. Then yeah, we're in Raw. Then we're in program, SmackDown. Dedicated program on a show. It leaves it fresh when they come back to Raw. Exactly. Yeah. Um, but then at that point, you couldn't have NXT t- you know, women's tag team championships. I don't think NXT UK has women's tag team championships. No, but I don't. They don't, so. do they? No. But my point is, if, if you were to go, gonna go with like the traveling idea, you can't you, have you American can't have forty ta- women's tag team, you know, women's yeah. tag team championships. So that would be a great thing because when Sasha and Naomi go to another brand, maybe two people on this brand kind of build their tag team, and then so when and Sasha and you have and them be like, back, and you have that team sort of be like your yeah. unofficial. Yeah. You're uncrowned tag team champions of that show, and they're like the team to beat, and that gives us a qualified. Exactly. Opponent. Yeah, I'm on board with that. I think that that would be a good step in the in the right direction. Which they're probably not going to do, but one can dream. Yeah, but moving on to uh, now again our longest match of the night. Uh, the what is he right now? The rated R. Um, the, the rated person R, who's uh, on per- the mountain of omnipotence. mountain omnipotent, omnipotent guy. Uh, Edge (laughs) defeated the phenomenal AJ Styles, the pit bull, the bulldog, whatever the hell he called him. Matilda. Too much stuff going on here in a singles match. Um, I called exactly how the match was going to end. I did. Phenomenal forearm into a spear. spear. Made sense. Um, Damian Priest, however, the X factor on this one. Did not anticipate particular interference, especially not specific interference. But Damien just rolls up and he's like, hey, I'm here. And AJ's like, why are you here? Damn. Whatever. Why are you here, Damien? And then he jumps for the phenomenal spear out of the air. Solid match. It was a pretty good match for two guys who know the industry, who are technically sound. Even though Edge is, again, he is one of those guys who's kind of up there. His body is broken. Um, AJ bumping his face on the stage as he walks out. Yeah, that was interesting. Um, did you see the the one camera angle that's like down in the crowd, and you actually see as he comes around the corner, just clunks his face. I, I didn't see it. No, it doesn't look. It. it doesn't look fun. It looks like it probably was uncomfortable, especially since it drew blood. But um, this for me, it. Well, did I say this was my match of the night? I said this I was my match did. of the night, and I think it's mostly just because they got time to breathe, and they had a little bit of story in it, as opposed to like RK Bro and them. Solid match. But it's just, we're tag teams. We're tag teams on WrestleMania. That's our story. <laughs> um, I know there's a little bit more to them. But it's not like a deeply personal yeah. thing as opposed to AJ gets jumped by Edge. He takes the concerto. Oh, his brain's broken. Oh, wait, he's back. Now he's going to get his vengeance on Edge. Oh, never mind. Edge won. And now we have to keep this going. Yeah. So go ahead and try and <laughs> Um, I thought that this match was fine. I didn't think that it was particularly great or excellent. I thought that finish was maybe a little bit weak. I would have loved it without the Damian Priest, you know, aspect. Yeah. I thought maybe if you did that on Raw, that would be a little bit more interesting. Um, or if he'd actually gotten involved and it was like, I don't know, something. Yeah. 
but um, I honestly thought AJ should have walked away with this win, um, and that should have been it. I don't think that this should have because I, that's also the problem too is that they I feel like WWE feels like every single particular match needs to have like a three month program, and it doesn't. <laughs> there are some matches where you, we could just do a one off. Everybody's good, um, especially like when it has that dream match aspect where it's like okay you're, you're not gonna it's very get... much the john cena rock treatment where you go hey we're gonna do this one time but wait a minute people got excited let's do it again next year yeah so yeah no and here's the my biggest problem is that edge's gimmick is fine i'm just getting too much undertaker vibes the lighting the dark suits the the cryptic promos the slow walk to the ring the dark side, like, okay, I get it, but just, you're really going in that Undertaker direction. I don't want you going there. Just I would almost, and I, my memory may be a little foggy, but I almost see him more as, like, the genuine, like, dark version of Mordecai. <laughs> may, yeah, okay. Like, that's, from, an that's a, from, like, an aesthetic standpoint. Yeah. Less actual Undertaker, so more, like, dark, like, just dark cult leader. Yeah. Um, and not in like a straight edge society type of way. Yeah. Um, I, I, I am curious where we're going with this program. If we throw Rhea, Rhea in there, that would gonna, be interesting. it's going to feel a little more straight edge society esque with its structuring, but I wouldn't, I mean, I would almost at that point, I think if you threw in one more guy, you're set. Yeah. Because, like, I think then at that point, you kind of got a couple of ways you can play is that then you can even throw Edge versus versus the Bloodline. Yeah. And you can have either a heel versus heel faction. Cue that up for thing. Survivor Series. Yeah. Or you flip the Bloodline, which I know I kind of hinted at the other day where I was like, I could see this being a turning point here in the nearish future. Yeah. Where Reigns turns the corner again and he's a, he comes back to being a good guy because I think people will buy into it more. Or they'll be more accepting of it now that they've gotten a taste of the bad. Yeah. Um, but I thought this was a pretty solid match. I I always trust these two to put on a on a decent match. Um, and a lot of the other stuff just didn't really live up to live up to the hype for me. Yeah. But uh, yeah, we can move to the next one, which we have match number six here on night two: Sheamus, Rich Holland, and Pete Dunne. Defeated the New Day, that which is Kofi Kingston and Xavier Woods, get well, Biggie, by a pinfall in a tag team match in one minute and 40 seconds. What a match. I will say this. This is actually the second time that the New Day has been involved in such a situation. Um, if you recall uh, a few years back when it was New Day versus the Bludgeon Brothers uh -huh. versus, I think, one more tag team, was it? That was also like a four minute deal. So I don't know what happens if we get down to the day of wrestling and they're like, hey guys, look, this card is stacked, so one match has got to get shortened. New day. Well, and sorry. They, and they might, like like I said, they got cut from night one, so they might have even gotten screwed on on night two. Maybe it was supposed to be a longer match, and it was just like, hey, I know we cut you guys from night one because we were running late, we're running late again, we'll put you guys on the show, go out there, do something for <laughs> two minutes, and then... You know, we'll pay you. Call it a day. Yeah. Um, uh, look, with no Big E return in sight, um, because his because of his broken neck, I don't really care to have this program continue right now. I would rather split them up and then have, again, one of those moments where uh, maybe, I don't know, six months down the line, New Day is doing something, these two jump them again, and then, and then Big E. Yeah, I don't know how long it's going to take for him to actually heal. It's but, going to take a minute, definitely. Yeah. Ass assuming, again, and I haven't heard any like negative prognosis coming back that are insinuating his career is like, done, done. But assuming he can come back, that would be how I would ideally like to see this play yeah. out. But I, I would like them to take a break. Because there's no end game unless you have the sixth guy. Yeah. So. So... Um, any other thoughts on that one before I lead up to the first part of this one? No, 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 no. Go ahead. All right. So then we move on to the uh, highly anticipated matchup between uh, former NFL punter Pat McAfee and uh, 
the, uh, uh, D- D- Drew McIntyre 2.0, uh, Austin Theory. <laughs> you have to explain that. Because Drew McIntyre was McMahon's chosen one back in his first run, uh, okay. and now we got Austin Theory stepping into that role. Um, it's just in theory, though. <laughs> Uh, nine minutes forty seconds. Hell of a match for a uh, for a commentator and a and a performer to put on. That was a beautiful superplex that McAfee did on he Austin. Yeah, to the top rope and then did it. Yeah. So um, Pat definitely impressed big time. I I I almost got like a reverse two thousand eleven vibe where you know Michael Cole was a heel, so yeah. he would cheer on the Miz. But now here he has Pat McAfee and he's like, come on, Pat, get up, Pat. Yeah. And, then, you know, especially when we get into the second part, Michael Cole from the announce table is trying to play, you know, sort of like a father figure. No, you, you, you got to walk away, Pat. No, you, you don't do this. You don't have to do this. Meanwhile, you've got Corey Graves filling the, the bad guy vibe. Um, but, yeah, hell of a match. I expected it to be um, a good showing by Pat with Austin going over. Yeah, and then we had I, what was it? I forget what the actual finish was. Was it a? Was it a? Did he hit a, a move or did he roll him up? I th- was it a roll up? I think it was a roll up. Yeah, yeah. I think it was some some version of a of a of a. Because he was gonna go for a punt kick, which is like kind of his assumed finisher. Yeah. Um, Austin Theory gets out of the way, and then I think McAfee does like a, a roll up. Yeah, I can't remember exactly. My brain can't envision it. But Pat goes over. Austin, blown away, just awestruck at the fact that he just lost to this guy. He and McMahon are off on the side of the the ring, and they're talking. Pat, in his overhypedness, gets gets a little bit ahead of himself and starts talking trash to McMahon, which leads to... The next match, spontaneously, uh, which was Mr. McMahon... Uh, versus Pat McAfee, McMahon wins by pinfall in 3 minutes and 45 seconds. And, a statistic for you, McMahon's first win at WrestleMania. Really? Yep. Huh. So, you know, we get Sasha's first win and, uh, and McMahon's first win. We are win. making history. Um, I, it was, a, it was awkward. It yeah, was an I, awkward I, match. <laughs> I wasn't sure what the meaning of this was. I almost felt like the excuse that was needed was someone was about to come out to yeah. save the day. Now, there were two guys that I had in mind. Number one, I was hearing rumblings that Shane McMahon apparently was in, was going to be there. Yeah. And I'm like, oh, we're going to And if that have... were the case, you could have led to like a Shane and Pat versus Austin and Vince tag match or something. Which takes me back to a McMahon in every corner type of deal. Yeah. For a hot second, this might have not been a popular choice, but I was thinking you might all of a sudden hear when it comes crashing down and it hurts <laughs> inside. And then my buddy made a joke about, okay, what if we just have the glass break and then you call it a day? 20 seconds later, the glass breaks and <laughs> here comes Steve Austin. Now, I th- at that point, it made sense because it's Texas and you don't want to rob the people of, oh... The night one got Austin, but yeah. because we got tickets for night two. And if you're bringing Austin in for one night, you might as well bring, in bring him, him in. Kind of, un- kind of Undertaker deal like, because yeah. he came out both nights just to kind of give everybody a chance to see the Undertaker. He's yeah. there. So Austin comes out and uh, gives a beautiful stunner to uh, Austin Theory. Um, and then Michael Austin Cole. Theory, Austin Theory real hard on the overselling, just like The Rock, the Rock. just like Sean. <laughs> and uh, Michael Cole always right there with his one-liners, Austin stuns Austin. <laughs> um, and then uh, Austin decides to share a beer with McMahon, and we get the most hilarious, botched, Stone Cold stunner of all time. Uh, and then Austin drinks a few beers, invites Pat McAfee to the ring. You never trust a rattlesnake. Pat McAfee gets stunned. Uh, and I, that was the thing was that night two was missing a segment. Yeah. Because it was very much match, 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 match. And usually in these moments, in these nights, you have at least one segment to kind of give the audience something. So this was that, and it was executed perfectly. 
I could have done away with the match of McMahon versus McAfee. I thought you could have just led to a blindside attack. Oh no, two people are on Pat McAfee. Who's going to save the day? Yeah. Glass breaks. Austin comes out, saves the day. You get your moment. But it was still great seeing Austin. You know, to me, it was sort of like a, a double treat because I see my hero in night one compete in a match. And then I also get a moment. So... Yeah. But yeah, I mean, it was it was just I think something to pop the crowd and give them a good time. So, but yeah, a lot of fun. And like we said, if this is the the if this is the the last hurrah of Stone Cold Steve Austin in like an in ring on the show capacity outside of like we're bringing all the legends in to like be on the stage or something. This is this is a a perfect way to yes. have done it. So, but that brings us to our final match of the night. The what was it biggest wrestling match, match of, of all, all time? time. Uh, winner takes all match for the WWE and WWE Universal Championship unification. I don't remember how they said it. Roman Reigns with Paul Heyman defeats Brock Lesnar via pinfall in another awkward finish, <laughs> which may or may, like I don't. Uh, like we'll talk about that, and then we'll kind of break the match down a little bit. After the Kimura, I, I like I heard him say it's out, it's out, and you couldn't, you weren't one hundred percent sure if he was just selling it or what. And then I saw one picture that made it look like his tricep might have been torn, uh, might have just been a Charlie horse from what it seems like, because he seemed like he was probably better the next night. Yeah, who knows just yet, but that could also play into why he didn't do anything the next night. Um. Kind of the same, kind of the same match we've expected from these guys anytime they faced off. Um, it started out okay. It had a different dynamic because you had face Brock Lesnar versus heel Roman Reigns. Um, something I thought about the other day, and I think we actually got it a couple of times over the two days. But something I thought about is I feel like we haven't really had like a ref bump segment in the old Attitude Era way yeah. in a while. Yeah. Where you have the the ref knocked out for an extended period of time, you have a big like Eddie Guerrero with a chair type of moment, um, and so we kind of got that here with um, the thing in the corner. Um, Roman, as soon as he started doing the, my, I was watching it with my roommate, and she goes, "So that that seems effective." Oh, he's doing it again about the Superman punches. Oh, yeah. Because he started to do the cock the arm, punch the thing, punch Brock, do it again, da da punch Brock. And you're like, great, this is super. And then you got the wind up spear. And did he do a, a back spear too? I think. Was that something that happened? Yes, yeah, that, that was a two for one, yeah. Um, I don't know if it's an homage to Spider Man No Way Home, but. Uh, <laughs> If you didn't see the movie, that doesn't mean anything to you. But anybody who has seen the movie would know. Um, I don't know if it was uh, why everybody's doing those back spears, but um, why? But not a terrible match. You have the ref bump that leads into the low blow and the title belt, which we were talking about. The belts aren't that heavy. I don't really buy them as a weapon that ends a match. And in this case, it didn't. Yeah. But then you have the Kimura lock, great transition. You go, oh, maybe, maybe, ah. And then he gets out of the Kimura, and he hits that random-ass spear, and that's the end of the match. And you're like, oh, okay. I guess this is it. Um, Which leads us to uh, what? I don't know. I don't know where we go from here, because Brock didn't show up the next night. One would assume Brock is on hiatus until they throw up the Brock signal in the future. Yeah. Um... But it was fine. What do you think about the match? And then we'll move on to Raw. Um, personally, this match didn't really deliver for me. Um, I honestly feel like their last two Mania matches, especially their first Mania match, was a lot more favorable than this one. Yeah. I th- And I think Roman even hinted, he's like, I've never beaten Brock at Mania. So at that point, you're like, okay, we're going for a Steve Austin versus The Rock finish. Yeah. Where Austin gets the first two, The Rock kind of gets the last one. Um, but then you're thinking, okay, so this should be a great match. Especially because you have all this hype of unification match. The third one in the series, you know, and, and all that. The greatest 
wrestling match of all time, which, by the way, any time that they've tried to force any of that, it's never worked it out. It never lives up to the hype. If a wrestling match is ever slated to be the best, it's usually after the fact, yeah. where nobody was, like kind of like Taker and Sean. Yeah. Nobody would have thought that that match was going to be what it is, and yeah. we're more than a decade after the fact. So we all we all pretty much knew that Roman was walking away with the win in this yeah. match. Um, sure, let's see where this goes. You're unifying two titles, but then if we're transitioning into Raw, um, you know, I told you guys that WrestleMania Raw was pretty much garbage. Um, you know, I remember there was a nice three or four year streak there where the WrestleMania Raw was actually a watchable show. And now I personally feel like it's it's no longer that because, you know, you think about the WrestleMania Raw, the only thing that stuck out to me as like, oh, this was an interesting and intricate part of the show was Cody Rhodes' promo. And that's where I, I told you guys that it seems like now Roman is kind of going to be doing his thing. And then Cody now is insinuating that he wants to win that belt for his father, for his family, and to kind of bring it full circle. I was under the impression that Roman hangs on to his title, and then Cody brings back the WWF championship. But then I know that you, to your point, you said you don't really think it's going to go that way. It's more going to go towards Roman versus Cody, which I wouldn't want that to happen now. I would want that like at a SummerSlam yeah. because to bring Cody back and be like, okay, now we're going to make you champion. Yeah. It's like, can we... Yeah, you got to ease him in a little bit, especially because yeah. he's been gone so long. But people were starting to get behind him as Stardust, which going back to the match real quick, you have that moment even where they he does the cartwheel and he throws, throws the Stardust thing away and they make a comment about it saying, oh, that's shedding the past. We're moving on. We're moving on. He is Cody Rhodes. He opens the promo the exact same way he started the AEW promo in the first place when he went over there. Um, I'm excited to see see where we go with Cody. So, like, let's jump into just kind of breaking down Raw. It's a shorter show, obviously. Yeah. Um, And we already talked about this one. Highly passionate promo. Yes. He got emotional a handful of times. Yes. That was not acting. Yeah. Um, it's it's a shoot, as we say. Yeah, uh, I saw one comment on a on I think the YouTube video, and somebody said he still misses his father terribly. You can tell. Yeah, who wouldn't? Exactly. And uh, to talk about, I want I I wish I could have put the the belt in his hand, and maybe I still metaphorically can. Yeah. I don't have a problem with us giving... Because Cody was making leaps and bounds there at the end of his WWE run. And then he goes over to AEW and, again, makes himself a, a proven man. Now he's back. Let's give him, let's give him a go. But, yeah, I think you, re, you reintroduce him with a few, a few uh, feuds and you have to build his credibility. Not that he isn't credible, especially with the, the reaction he got. Granted, it was Mania. We know who he is. Yeah. We remember who Cody Rhodes is. Um, but yeah, you've got to build the credibility, put him in a couple of notable feuds and have him go over before we're going to buy him beating the tribal chief. And we always talk about that about WWE. It, seem, it seems, I don't want to say always, but there is always that tendency to either do something way too quick yeah. or to milk it until when you're like, please just pull the trigger. There is never just that right moment. Yeah. Um, and, and when there is kind of like WrestleMania, you're like, fantastic. That's exactly. And my friend made a comment and he said, when WWE gets it right, it's the best thing in the world and nobody can do it better. Yeah. But that's when yeah. they get it right. So it, It's like playing a game of baseball. Your batting average is never that good. You can have a hundred at bats and you may hit it 10 times. Um, but that's 90 times you didn't. But when you do... You hit a home run. Uh, there you go. But, yeah. So it's something that they have to work on. And I don't, like... 
You obviously don't want to go out every week and be like, all right, here's the best show you're ever going to see. All right, here's another best show. Because then people are going to be like, Jesus Christ, this is, never, is, this, is this what we get? We get amazing shows. And then as soon as it drops off, they're like, what the hell was that? But then we move on to Sasha Banks and Naomi defeat Rhea Ripley and Liv Morgan. Uh, follow up from the previous night. You see Rhea give Liv the cold shoulder and then the awkward heel, heel tease. Oh, uh, we're going we're gonna to have a title match next week. I talked to them. You're getting a heel turn next week. Yeah. It's going to happen. Because you, I'm, I had the thought, because I know that uh, Kev uh, made a comment about Sasha. Oh, so Sasha and Naomi can lose the belts the next, the next night on Raw. Well, they didn't lose, they didn't lose the belts. Yeah. But, uh, yeah, they're not going to lose them to Rhea and, and Liv next week. We're going to see that heel turn. And, I mean, if I can comment on that for just a quick second, with Liv and, and Ripley, um, I, again, this is one of those instances where it's like, can we get a program first before you pull the trigger? Because it'll give these four women something to do. Yeah. You will have the dynamic of Naomi and Sasha building up themselves as, okay, we're a credible tag team. And then you have Liv and Ripley who they're they're trying to score that win. They're trying to get it done. But one or the other kind of becomes the weak link of the team. Yeah. And so this is the problem. It's like we're already at that phase where we're getting a heel turn tease. And it's like. Yeah. Especially when it was it's so fresh off the, the one with Nikki, like I said. Like, can we first work a WrestleMania backlash match and then we can start getting into the heel turn stuff. Like, can we yeah, at least I, have one program? I feel like we don't save enough stuff to do on the pay per views. I feel like we do, like you're saying, stuff gets rushed or gets too long. Yeah. And instead of saying we got four weeks to backlash, like you ever played GM mode? <laughs> you 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 do something big on the pay per view for that reason. Yeah. Have your heel turn from Rhea at backlash. All right. Maybe now, maybe with the whole edge thing, they're tr- they're like, okay, let's just break her off from from Liv as fast as we can, so we can integrate her. Yeah. Okay. If that happens, I can I can forgive them for overcorrecting. Yeah. But in general, it is a problem that they have. However, we then have the. Uh, You're right. <laughs> we do have the. Uh, very peculiar debut of a uh, new superstar named Ezekiel. Mm-hmm. Looks remarkably like, uh, apparently, his brother, Elias. Or their uncle, Damien Sando. <laughs> who comes out and confronts Kevin Owens in a very strange segment. I'm not even going to lie. KO is just in the ring. Ezekiel walks out looking like a standard-ass talent. I feel like KO is the verbal voice behind what every single person in the arena and what every person at home is thinking. Yeah. Um, I, we, I've, I mentioned this to you probably twice today that when Elias was Elias, yeah, you had a gimmick where this guy didn't have to wrestle each and every night or ever for that matter. And he was relevant. He had the audience in the palm of his hand. So you take that, like, that's why I get mad when Vince says, oh, but you have to get over first. It's like, are we watching the same program here? Yeah. Are we watching the same thing? If there was someone who was over without wrestling frequently, that was your guy. Yeah. So why, why the change? Why the repackage? A, a repackage is, is, is usually done when someone is just dwindling yeah. and they're not connecting and it's not working. Like and, call leader Bray Wyatt into the fiend. Exactly. So to take someone and repackage them, even though it's working, it's just, it's weird. But it's, I, I think this is going to die within like two months. I don't see this working out because he's generic now. Like I don't see anything that stands out about yeah. him. Now he's not a bad wrestler. No. He's, he's a solid performer. I'm willing to give it a chance to see what the hell is going on in their mind because nothing make nothing's clear right now. But I'm interested to see. However, yeah. we finally, finally, the Veer has come back to Raw. I guess now we're veering into this direction. Anyway, Veer Mahan. Um, after weeks of, of coming to Raw, uh, finally arrives on April 4th 
to come out and just obliterate Ray and Dominic Mysterio. And I, for one second, and I, like, for, for half a second, and then I went, that, that's almost worse. I went, is his finishing move going to be the camel clutch? And then he did a half camel clutch. And I went, that's almost worse. <laughs> because it seems any time we get somebody of Foreign. this ethnic Descent. realm, they end up like, that. I'm pretty sure it was Jinder's thing for a minute. Yeah. It was Muhammad Hassan's thing. Iron Sheik. Iron Sheik. Uh, I'm trying. There, there has to be somebody else. Who, when Sergeant Slaughter somebody? turned, uh, he started using it too. Yeah. So like, why can't these? Why do these guys all have to do? Dan. This? Why does everybody have to do the camel clutch? Um, I I I'm a big proponent for impact finishers. We've talked about this. Big proponent for impact finishers. Big proponent for theme music that pops so you know exactly who it is. Who it is. First note. Glass Shatter. Dolph Ziggler. uh, Undertaker. Undertaker. Um, If you smell. All of them. Yeah. And then you have situations like this where he's he's like, is he Indian? I I believe. Well, I mean... (laughs) So it, it, you've got your, like, generic Indian wrestler. And he fits the same mold as any, like, Middle Eastern figure we've had. And... How long before we get Veer versus Mahal? I don't know. I don't know. But he's also still got Shaky. Shanky? Shanky. 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 <laughs> that too. Uh, Spanky? Brian Kendrick? Get it? Uh, so anyway, unimpressed. Um, they're going to fight next week, and I'm still going to be unimpressed. How about you? Same. All right. Can we please veer off into something else? 100%. So we can actually talk about Bianca Belair. So we addressed this a little bit already. Bian- uh, Bianca wins the belt. Becky, nowhere to be seen. Bianca takes a shiner. I get a little bit of heel vibe out of the promo. I could see it being a double turn at some point. I'm interested to see what happens next week because I feel like next week is going to be that deciding factor as to what direction we're going. Yeah. If we see her just obliterate somebody and act like this cocky ass champion, she's gonna she's turning heel. And I'm I'm all for it. I'm all for it. Bianca has all the makings of a good heel champion. Yeah, and like I I, I mentioned this that she's been a face for quite a while now. So to see her like turn heel it's doing her a favor because even before she can get stale or complacent, you have this new element now that you can tune into. Yeah. So it's just the case. And like, see, but that's the problem too. It's like, who do you put in front of her? Because you're not developing stars. Who do you put in front of her? Yeah. So we just talked about it. So for argument's sake, if Rhea turns heel, we're not doing that because you're not going to have heel versus heel. Liv could be a potential contender, and that's it. Yeah. Sasha and Naomi are doing their own thing. Yeah, they're, they're not going to run their tag gonna, division. Yeah. Becky, right now, seems like is out of the picture. So, who do we go to? Yeah. It's tough. Um, we don't have time for that conversation today, but yeah, you'd have to dig a little deeper to find like viable candidates because. I like I would, you know what I would almost think an interesting feud would be, in spite of what you just said, Bianca versus Shayna. And you have it be heel versus heel, and you have Bianca beat Shayna up. Like I love Shayna, but I think that's one way you can you can solidify Bianca as as a dominant heel champion is you have her go out there, take another heel and just shut her down. And I think that would be a way to go. It would be more viable or more believable if Shayna wasn't watered down like she has been ever since she quite frankly lost to Becky uh, two years ago at Mania. But yes, I can see what you're saying. But like, see, the fact that we're having a hard time thinking of a contender just pretty much tells you yeah. the direction. 
But we're all, I mean, we also do, WrestleMania starts a new season. Maybe it's time to shake up a bunch of talent. So maybe we turn Shayna, we turn Shayna face, we turn Becky face, we turn Bianca heel. Uh, I don't, I don't really know who else we would turn, but you could, you could turn a bunch of people right now and get away with it. So moving on, we have a uh, surprising appearance um, with very little weight to it of the NXT Championship being defended on Raw with uh, Braun Breaker going over Dolph Ziggler. Saw a thing suggesting Ziggler was originally supposed to get a little bit longer of an NXT title run. Are we surprised? Um, Braun Breaker (laughs) regains, is now a two-time NXT heavyweight champion. He's fine. Yeah, I I (laughs) thought that uh, Dolph Ziggler had a little bit of a resurgence when he, just the first time that he made his presence known in NXT, I thought it was great to kind of once again take someone who's been stale on your roster and give them something new. Yeah. Um, while it being the old them. And it's like, yeah, they just kind of did this. And I guess this was like their main selling point was, oh, we're going to have a championship change and that'll be their WrestleMania Raw highlight. So but, nobody cared. But my question is, why is the NXT championship being defended on the wrong show? Because it can be. Um, Very well. But, yeah. Then we move on to one of the minor talking points of the show, and that's MVP turns on Bobby Lashley, sides with Omos, which we kind of glossed over a little bit ago. Um, MVP is now the mouthpiece for Omos. Omos doesn't... He, I'm not, he's, he's not a good talker. Yeah. Uh, so having MVP there, it's basically the same thing. Bobby's gotten better. Yeah. Like, Bobby has learned to carry his own promos, which he didn't used to be able to do. Yeah. And now he... Still needs a little bit of work, because I feel like there's a little bit of awkwardness when Bobby talks, and I don't think it's his fault. It's just the script that he keeps on getting handed. Yeah. But But he'll get more comfortable in time, and uh, hopefully that'll carry on. But Omas doesn't know how to do promos, so... MVP, not a bad um, candidate, candidate, but it is what it is. Then we move on. I'm sorry. I'm just spearheading all of these and then letting you talk <laughs> about them. Get it, Spear? Uh, Usos and Austin Theory go over um, RK Bro and Finn Balor. Austin Theory, like, pick, if he takes the belt off of Finn, like, again, Finn wasn't even on WrestleMania. So... Did, would it really matter? Put it on Austin. Use that as a prop to continue elevating this kid. I'm fine with that, honestly. My biggest problem is that, once again, we fall into the trap of someone who was literally in catering months ago, and then spontaneously someone came up with a decision of, let's pull him out of catering, and let's suddenly plaster him all over the show. Yeah, And that has always... like It happened with Bianca, too, you know, where she debuted... The night after WrestleMania 36, we didn't see her until, like, Rumble right before 37. Yeah. Where, like, she starts building up momentum. It's like, despite the fact that we got a great now female wrestler who's a pillar for the show, but it's like, there's a little bit of awkwardness when someone all of a sudden is not on your screen and then is on every other segment or every other show being given a spotlight. Now, what I will say is I think you can get away with that more when they're heels. Because, well, because the problem with, like, Roman was people got tired of him being shoved down our throats. Because, But he was a good guy. We were supposed to like him. But you're sitting there going, I, why is this guy suddenly beating everybody? Yeah. Why is he suddenly unde- undefeatable? He's the, the, he's the new hero. I don't know. But if you take an Austin Theory, then you have that built-in heat where people are like, why is he beating Finn Balor for the United States Championship? What is this? Why is this happening? Why is he hanging out with Vince McMahon at his cottage on the weekend? Look, don't ask questions you don't want the answers to. But the fact of the matter is, um, I think that that is not a bad thing for Austin to have been just kind of taken out of nowhere and now to shove him over top of other people because it gives him a natural uh, yeah. a natural heat. And so given the fact that Finn holding the U.S. title had zero bearing on this weekend, might as well put it on this kid that they actually care about 
Not to say that I want Finn to go away, but it seems like a better long-term plan. Yeah. And it, honestly, if you look at this from like a... And I do not know all of the ins and outs of writing television, but if you look at this from a television writing standpoint, you're supposed to kind of draft out your season. Yeah. Before you start doing anything. And I think that if WWE... Because, uh, again, I don't feel like they do. I feel like if WWE took these quadrants, right, of the year, and they treated each of those like a, its own season and drafted out from WrestleMania to SummerSlam, <sighs> these are all the stories we're going to do. Yeah. Then great. Then you have some forethought. You can plan ahead. Like, I, I, you could already have this Bianca and Becky thing planned out. You could have whatever the hell else we talked about. There's so many. You can listen back if you want to hear our entire two-hour rant about this stuff. But uh, I think that that's what they need to do is actually plan this stuff out. But that's a good way to go if they're going to run on the fly. I brought this up a few times and I know for a fact that he's probably not as popular now as he was once before amongst all those wrestling fans. But uh, Hulk Hogan, when he was doing Austin's podcast a few years ago, he said... Any time when I was told that I would lose or win or draw or whatever, my two questions before each and every decision that was made was, who's winning and where are we going with yeah. this decision? And I feel like if you are WWE, no matter what match it is, if it's your mid-card match, a match that you want to throw away, your main event, those should always be the two questions you ask. Yeah. Is For example, for example here, Roman and Brock. Okay, we're going to have Roman win. Great. Where do we go with that? Yeah. And then you have someone play devil's advocate where maybe Brock wins. Okay, where do we go with that? And you see what's most lucrative. <laughs> yeah, or we don't go with anybody. It comes to a no contest or a draw or a count out or a whatever. Okay, where do we go with that? Yeah. And I think that's the biggest thing, much like for Mania. Okay, Bianca won against Becky Lynch. Where do we go with that? Yeah. And it, it, if, you know, counter argument, let's just say we're kind of thinking of maybe Becky walking away with the win. Okay, where do we go from here to SummerSlam to two weeks from now, whatever the deal, what direction do we want to go in? And I think what's so different from before is that you hear uh, stories about how superstars say, oh, yeah, one day I was just in catering and Vince McMahon said, hey, I'm thinking of pairing you up with so-and-so, like whether it's for a tag team or a feud. And he's like, me and this other person, we just start talking about ideas. Maybe we can go here. Maybe we can do this. Maybe we can do that. Maybe you come and you attack me. I go away for a while. Then I come back and we do this big program. I feel like now it's just, oh, Vince wants you to do this. Oh, but Vince said, oh, but Vince this. Oh, but Vince that. And there is no input of well, what does Bianca think of the situation? What is Becky? And of course, there's that philosophy of too many cooks in the kitchen. Yeah. I get it. But when you have people like Becky or Bianca, it's like I can trust them going into a room for 30 minutes and just bouncing back ideas. Okay. Yeah, but in a, in, a, in a kitchen, you also have your head, your head chef, you've got your sous chef, you've got you have all, helpers. all, the, all the, yes. the hands who are tasking on different individual things. And that should kind of be the same thing here. Everybody has... Something to contribute. Bianca is over there making the sauce. Great. <laughs> now, if they're new to the business and yeah. they don't have that exposure, yes. I'm not saying give them 50% of creative control over their food, but I would love to hear their thoughts. Yeah. Like, what do you but, think? Yeah, have an idea session yeah. with these people. Or like, like a writer's room. And I don't know if they have a writer's room or if they just like throw shit at each other. Um, but... Where, where they just say, hey, I don't even know who's on staff anymore, but they go to, to the bookers and they say, hey, you're in charge of this match. Figure it out. Ah, uh, okay. Have an actual writer's team. Have an actual team of writers and have some degree of people who know the business and have some who are like TV writers and have them collaborate because the people who know the business, people like us, people like Freddie Prince Jr., people like that, you just read my mind because I was just going to bring up Freddie Prince Jr. He did an interview two, three months ago where he talked about this. Yeah. When he was in WWE, he even said a lot of people look down on him. Like, yeah. this guy from Hollywood, he's going to write my promos? No, I don't think so. And he even said it himself. Look, from the sports entertainment aspect, he doesn't know squat. Yeah. 
But if you want someone on the mic to cut a promo and it to yeah. mean something, this guy's your guy. Yeah. You know, and so, yeah, it's like that collaboration that you're talking about. That's exactly what I feel like is missing. It's yeah. just people walk into the show. Here's what you're doing. Just make it work. And even when they do make it work. But this is inconsistent with my character. Eh, but that's what we're going with. But to play devil's advocate, there are moments where it isn't consistent with the character, yeah. but the person makes it work. But still, it's like. Yeah, but you're not drawing, so we're going to have to repackage you like an Elias. Yeah. You know? I can only imagine, yeah, your gimmick is you, you strum a guitar and you say despicable things depending on what city you're in. He made it work. Yeah. And it's like, okay, we're going to do a vignette of you standing over your grave and we're going to bring you back as Ezekiel. Or we're going we're gonna to release you and bring in your brother. I, I will <laughs> I will play devil's advocate for one second. If we were in the pandemic, uh, they era, almost should have done that. They almost should have done. I, I want to say pandemic <laughs> era, but we're still kind of in the pandemic era. But when we were in the Thunderdome era, yeah, I would have loved if they could have like played off of that. Yeah, like you shoot the match in a way where you have Ezekiel and then you have Elias. Yeah, and you know, like you could. That's like one of those things that you can get away with, kind of like with um. Like with The Fiend, Alexa, and Randy. A lot of those skits, if it wasn't in the Thunderdome era, would not have worked. Because yeah. there were instances where Alexa is wrestling a match as, as normal Alexa Bliss. Or The Fiend is being burned alive. Yeah. Lights turned out, it comes back on, full makeup, full gear. She's Demon Alexa yeah. Bliss Things or whatever took way it. too much time to do otherwise. Exactly. So that, yeah, there was the one where she jumped back and forth. And you like wouldn't twice. have been able to do yeah, that. Yeah, she was normal Alexa. Fiend Alexa went back to normal Alexa. So that you could have gotten away with if we were in the Thunderdome era. Since then, we're not in the Thunderdome era. So what they're going with with that is just... But to go back to my point of before, yes, you're right. A collaboration needs to happen between writers and superstars. Um, moving forward, we got the uh, debut of Edge and Damian Priest side by side. We'll M- see. Ministry of Darkness. I mean, yeah. uh, Edge and Damian Priest. Yeah. yeah, we'll we'll see where this goes. Um, I I've never been a huge fan of Damian Priest personally. He was kind of growing on me for a minute yeah. when he was having the U.S. title defenses. Yeah. Yeah, U.S. title defenses, he was just kind of wrestling, and there were a few matches where we saw that mean streak kind of come out where, you know, he would give you the little eyes and, like, turn it, but, um, yeah, I don't know. We'll, we'll see. Like, it, 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 again, it could be interesting to see this faction go against the bloodline. We'll see. Yeah. Um, Damien better find a new finisher, though. Ah, um, uh, that's right. <laughs> Uh, Street Profits versus Alpha Academy. I I I don't remember when, but my brain clicked with this being a tornado tag team match. And I don't know. I think it was as soon as Adam Pierce came out and started talking. I went, oh, he's gonna make it a tornado tag match. <laughs> um They should do more of this. Like it's featured in the games. Um, but we don't see tornado matches very often, and even when, like they go through Texas throughout the course of the year, and I don't think they take advantage of it enough. Yeah. But and don't even call it a Texas tornado match. Just. Well, I, I may be politically incorrect, but I think Texas tornado is when there's three teams, because when it's just two teams, it's just tornado tag, and then when wow. you have more than three, I I could be wrong. Maybe. I could be wrong, but that that's that's usually the kind of the lingo that I've come to. Gotcha. Well, either way. Either way. They should do a couple more. They should factor in these matches a little bit more. There's there's too much normal tag team. Yeah. Like, do a Mix steel cage up. match. Do exactly. A we don't get enough gimmicks. Yeah. It's, it's like a shitty GM. Normal. Out here. Yeah, normal tag team. This spot, actually, uh, Montez Ford is ridiculous. He's crazy. He's charismatic, but he's crazy. I know you guys can't see what I'm talking about, but there's a moment in the match where Montez, from one corner of the ring, goes running at the other, and he leap not leapfrogs, but he sentons, doesn't he? Yeah. He, like, leaping sentons over top of the, uh, the opposing uh, post onto everybody else in the match. The man is ridiculously athletic. And, and he's charismatic, too. Like, I see a bright future for that yeah. guy, for sure. He just has to beef up a little bit. He's a little scrawny. <laughs> um, n- nothing wrong with that. He's just small compared to other guys. Hey, man, but then, smoke. one more time, we get to the main event segment of the show, right? This is the last thing? Yes. 
Um, Roman Reigns comes out. You get this cool image of him with the two belts. You've got the Usos. They've got their belts. Paul Heyman wearing a belt. Whatever. Everybody got belts. Um, and we do nothing. We do nothing with it. You don't start another program. You don't introduce a competitor. There's no face turn, heel turn, surprise return, surprise yeah. go away. So nothing. what was the? What's the point? I don't like. I don't care. I get it. You're the champion. Do something. Well, the funny thing is, they say our next step will be known on SmackDown. Yeah, it's like wonderful, but that's not right now. This yeah. is supposed to be the biggest Raw of the year, yeah. and you're don't, telling me about plans from four or five days from. Don't now. use your main event segment as a commercial for the next show. Yeah. That's that's the easiest way for me to put it. Don't do that. Do something. Either don't have this be your main event segment or do something with it. Very, very simple. <laughs> I would say you strip Seth away from coming out and giving Cody a handshake. Yeah. You have him come out in this segment. Yeah. Because then you pick up from... Well, because Royal Rumble, which, by the way, I think that was match of the night when Seth came out with the shield gear and yeah. you can see Roman was like, oh, he's doing this to me. We never got like a clear cut finish to that program. It was just a one off. We're done. Seth goes, does his thing with KO. Roman is doing his thing with Brock. And it's like, bring that back. Yeah. Like, or conversely, you have Cody open the show. Maybe you have Cody end the show. Not to necessarily kickstart this program, but you have it be. Tease it. Yeah, you have Roman out there and he's talking a lot of game and you have Cody's music hit again and people are like, oh shit. And he comes out and he basically cuts a little promo and he says, but I'll see you real soon, Roman. And then he goes backstage. There, that's it. That's it. And so either of those would have been a better use of use of this time than saying, yeah, we're here. We're the champions. Look at us. We're great. All right. See you Friday. <laughs> so, yeah, not a stellar Raw. Nothing really got accomplished. I'm not optimistic for SmackDown really either. Yeah. Um, Because I know we're going to basically have Charlotte do the same thing Bianca did. We're going to have, we'll probably have the segment we just talked about where somebody will come out and it'll probably be Drew. I would hazard a guess to say it's going to be Drew. But uh, we'll see. There was also a a dark match that took place after Raw went off the air. It was KO versus Cody Rhodes. And uh, Cody wins and sort of gives everybody a proper send-off. Thank you, everybody, and what what not. I thought that that was sort of great for the crowd, at least, to kind of get their money's worth because ending it on this note is just very stale. I, I need WWE to find it in themselves to do more multi band matches. I need it. Because uh, going back again to the Attitude Era, you had a lot of triple threats. You had a lot of fatal fours. You had the big the the big matches. But like even the Kurt Angle, Stevie Richards, um, Jericho triple threat with the two belts. Great match. Yeah. That match holds up. Um, but we get these boring ass singles match, singles match, singles match for everything, liven it up. Yeah, we don't mix it up enough, and I think that's a a big thing that if, if you treat WrestleMania like New Year's Day for WWE, their resolution should be to freshen up the product a little bit more so that people actually feel like anything from show to show is different. Yeah, because eh, a lot of times it's not. It becomes a byproduct. Yeah, I mean, so much has been said, and, you know, uh, again, I repeat, the only thing that was salvageable out of this three-hour show was Cody's promo. Because I want you to think about that for just one second. You talk about having a superstar come out and having their intentions be known. Cody did just that. Exactly. Came out, here's who I am, you know who I am, here's why I'm out here. (laughs) Yeah. Look at this picture. This is the story. Now here's what I want to do. This is why you should care about what I do next. Exactly. I, like I think Paul Heyman w- is beyond ecstatic at that promo because he always says that. People always ask him, well, what's the? how do you do your promos? What is it that makes it? And he always says, I state who I am, why I'm there, and why you should care. Yeah. Now, he doesn't say that verbatim. Well, here's why you should care. He, he sort of mentions that in the promo. Here's my intention. Here's what we're going to do. Yeah, Here's where we're going. Tell. It's exactly. Show, don't tell. Exactly. 
And that's exactly what Cody did. In, in a sense, he kind of told you, but he also showed you why. And then the rest of the show was like, we're here. <laughs> no, we're not talking about the Wyatt family. Um, yeah. Yeah. Um, we're in a new season of WWE, especially if you're signed in on Peacock. Everything is listed as a season. Um, but let's see where they go. We'll give it a little bit of time and we'll see if... I'm if, assuming uh, the draft is coming up where it's didn't time we just to... just do that like two months ago? Did we? I think so. I think at this point, like, it doesn't matter because they're doing it like once every four months. It's yeah. time to shake things I'm, up again. Well, I mean, trades trades are, are there. It's just, If you want to be sports entertainment, trading in the off-season is a thing you can toy with. You don't have to leave your roster the same the entire goddamn year. Well, here's the thing, is that I feel like the last two or three years that we've been... The last time that I can tell you when a draft I feel meant something was that late 2016 era yeah. where you had Ziggler, AJ, Cena, and Ambrose on SmackDown, and then you had Reigns and Seth and... All these other guys on Raw. Yeah. And Mick Foley and Steph were your GM for that. Brian Danielson and Shane were your GMs for SmackDown. That's the last time that you felt... And both shows were trying to give you great competition. You had Ambrose as your champion. AJ was your champion. So, like, they were actually doing things. And I, I forget when it was. Three years ago, four years ago, where charlotte goes to smackdown so and so goes to raw so and so goes to smackdown oh because charlotte and andrade are together we're going to bring charlotte back on raw so that they, those two don't get disconnected we're going to bring this person back they basically undid like six or seven draft picks yeah and it's like what was the point then? yeah so same deal here like if it was a proper draft where two shows Separate roster, separate entities. No one's going to mess with each other. If we go back to that, sure, bring in a draft and spice things up, especially because you need a new competition for the Biancas of the world and the Charlottes of the world and whatever. So, but it's that. Well, that's one of the things that I do really enjoy out of um, this new GM mode on 2K22 is you can do face heel turns. And there have been times where I'm sitting there, where I was sitting there playing and I, I went, shit. I have four face females and I got one heel. I got to fix this. Yeah. And then I look at it and I go, okay, who would I... I go, who would I find fun as a heel turn? And, like, I had Montez Ford. I tried to make him uh, my champion and he got pissy and, like, jumped ship. I was like, all right, whatever. But, yeah, you don't always just have to move superstars. You can change superstars. People change. Well... If we talk to... I hate to go back to it because it's like beating a dead horse. Elias. Yeah. Like, there are people who desperately need to be repackaged. Don't get repackaged. Yeah. And then you have people who... They have a solid gimmick. They're getting chance from the crowd. People are behind them. And all you gotta do is find something to do with them. And but... Then they, and then they do shit like this. Yeah, and it's like... Well, there goes another one. Yeah. So... Yeah, I don't know. Um... Overall opinion about WrestleMania this year, just as a collective show, uh, end result, what did you feel? Are we, are we including Raw in it, or we just want the two weekends? Sure, let's include Raw. So, the entire WrestleMania weekend, I'd be like a C. Pretty much, yep. Very, very neutral, very gen. Indifferent. Yeah. Um, do I think there are a couple of seeds planted that could blossom into something? Yeah, do I necessarily believe we will water those plants to grow? No. But we'll see. I'll, I, I will always give them a couple of weeks after WrestleMania to see where they're going, to see if they're going somewhere. Yeah. So let's see. Let's see what they got. Yeah, I'm pretty much there with you. Uh, we said it at the very beginning that you could literally strip away seven or eight matches. Yeah. And you could still have a WrestleMania worthy performance, or you can. It'll still feel like WrestleMania in one night. Yeah. Um, WrestleMania Raw. You know, I I think we're. I I'll, I'll go back to it because I think it encompasses what that night should be. 
we're far removed from a Dolph Ziggler cashing in type of episode of Raw. Yeah. Now it just seems like we have one or two strong points and then just fill the rest of the show up. Kind of like Mania, if we're being honest. We have this match, this match. Okay, but now we have to fill up another 13 matches. Okay, get so-and-so on there, get so-and-so on there. All right, cool. We got a show. Let's do it. Yeah. So, I don't know. We'll see. Um, I said it in the beginning. It seems like when WWE does business the right way, you get a very good result. Yeah. You get Cody Rhodes. You get Austin. And then when they kind of just lay back and they throw stuff at the wall and maybe this might work. We don't know. We haven't planned for it, but let's just, let's do it. Mm, not so much. Yeah. So. Well, we'll th- th- thank you guys for sticking along with us all this way. Another WrestleMania done. It's hard to believe we're almost at WrestleMania 40, actually. But let us know what you guys think in the comments section below. What did you guys think of the two nights of WrestleMania and the WrestleMania Raw? Where do you think that the direction of some of these storylines and feuds is going? Let us know. What would your, out of everything that's transpired, what would your number one best storyline be? Like, what is something you would personally put into play? Yeah. And so let us know. Thank you so much for joining us. We have no idea when we'll come to you again. Uh, It might be sometime soon. might be sometime down the road. We are not sure. But um, in the meantime, we want to thank you all for joining us. We have another WrestleMania episode done and dusted. Thank you for joining us. And we will see you all next time.